Hello and welcome back to Baby Ellis' Stories. We now return to The Invisible Man by H. G. Wells. Chapter 8. In Transit. The eighth chapter is exceedingly brief and relates that Gibbons, the amateur naturalist of the district, while lying out on the spacious open downs without a soul in a couple of miles of him, as he thought, and almost dozing, heard close to him the sound as of a man coughing, sneezing, and then swearing savagely to himself, and looking, beheld nothing. Yet the voice was indisputable. It continued to swear with that breadth and variety that distinguishes the swearing of a cultivated man. It grew to a climax, diminished again, and died away in the distance, going, as it seemed to him, in the direction of Adderdean. It lifted to a spasmodic sneeze and ended. Gibbons had heard nothing of the morning's occurrences, but the phenomenon was so striking and disturbing that his philosophical tranquillity vanished. He got up hastily and hurried down the steepness of the hill towards the village as fast as he could go. Chapter 9 Mr. Thomas Marvel You must picture Mr. Thomas Marvel as a person of copious, flexible visage, a nose of cylindrical protrusion, of cylindrical protrusion, a licorice, ample, fluctuating mouth, and a beard of bristling eccentricity. His figure inclined to a bon point. Bon bon point. On bon point, a plump or fleshy part of a person's body, in particular a woman's bosom. His figure inclined to en bon point. His short limbs accentuated this inclination. He wore a furry silk hat, and the frequent substitution of twine and shoelaces for buttons apparent at critical points of his costume, marked a man essentially bachelor. Mr. Thomas Marvel was sitting with his feet in a ditch by the roadside over the down towards Adderdean, about a mile and a half out of Ipping. His feet, save for socks of irregular open work, were bare. His big toes were broad and pricked like the ears of a watchful dog. In a leisurely manner, he did everything in a leisurely manner. He was contemplating, trying on a pair of boots. They were the soundest boots he had come across for a long time, but too large for him, whereas the ones he had were, in dry weather, a very comfortable fit, but too thin-soled for damp. Mr. Thomas Marvel hated roomy shoes, but then he hated damp. He had never properly thought out which he hated most, and it was a pleasant day, and there was nothing better to do. So he put the four shoes in a graceful group on the turf and looked at them. And seeing them there among the grass and springing agrimony, it suddenly occurred to him that both pairs were exceedingly ugly to see. He was not at all startled by a voice behind him. They're boots, anyhow, said the voice. They are charity boots, said Mr. Thomas Marvel, with his head on one side, regarding them distastefully. And which is the ugliest pair in the world? And which is the ugliest pair in the whole blessed universe? I'm darned if I know. Hmm, <clears throat> said the voice. I've worn worse. In fact, I've worn none. But none so audacious 
ugly if you'll allow the expression. I've been caging boots, in particular, for days, because I was sick of them. They're sound enough, of course, but a gentleman on tramp sees such a thundering lot of his boots. And if you'll believe me, I've raised nothing in the whole blessed country, try as I would. But them, look at him, and a good country for boots too, in a general way. But it's just my promiscuous luck. I've got my boots in this country ten years or more, and then they treat you like this. It's a beast of a country, said the voice, and pigs for people. Ain't it? said Mr. Thomas Marvel. Lord, but them boots, it beats it. He turned his head over his shoulder to the right to look at the boots of his interlocutor with a view to comparisons. And lo, were the boots of his interlocutor, where the boots of his interlocutor should have been were neither legs nor boots. Interlocutor, a person who takes part in a dialogue or conversation. Interlocutor. Interlocutor. He turned his head over his shoulder to the right to look at the boots of his interlocutor with a view to comparisons. And lo, where the boots of his interlocutor should have been were neither legs nor boots. He was irradiated by the dawn of a great amazement. Where are you? said Mr. Thomas Marvel, over his shoulder and coming on all fours. He saw a stretch of empty downs, with the wind swaying the remote green-pointed furze bushes. Am I drunk? said Mr. Marvel. Have I visions? Was I talking to myself? What the? Don't be alarmed, said a voice. None of your ventriloquizing me, said Mr. Thomas Marvel, rising sharply to his feet. Where are you? Alarmed indeed. Don't be alarmed, repeated the voice. You'll be alarmed in a minute, you silly fool, said Mr. Thomas Marvel. Where are ye? Let me get my mark on ye. Are ye buried? said Mr. Thomas Marvel, after an interval. There was no answer. Mr. Thomas Marvel stood bootless and amazed, his jacket nearly thrown off. Piwit, said a piwit, very remote. Piwit indeed, said Mr. Thomas Marvel. This ain't no time for foolery. The down was desolate, east and west, north and south. The road with its shallow ditches and white bordering stakes ran smooth and empty north and south, and save for that peewit, the blue sky was empty too. So help me, said Mr. Thomas Marvel, shuffling his coat onto his shoulders again. It's the drink I might have known. It's not the drink, said the voice. You keep your nerves steady. Ow, oh, said Mr. Marvel, and his face grew white amidst its patches. It's the drink, his lips repeated noiselessly. He remained staring about him, rotating slowly backwards. I could have sworn I heard a voice, he whispered. Of course you did. It's there again, said Mr. Marvel, closing his eyes and clasping his hand on his brow with a tragic gesture. He was suddenly taken by the collar and shaken violently, and left more days than ever. Don't be a fool, said the voice. I'm off my blooming chump, said Mr. Marvel. It's no good. It's fretting about them blarsted boots. I'm off my blessed blooming chump, or its spirits. Neither one thing nor the other, said the voice. Listen. Chump, said Mr. Marvel. One minute, said the voice, penetratingly tremulous.
with self-control. Well, said Mr. Thomas Marvel, with a strange feeling of having been dug in the chest by a finger. You think I'm just imagination, just imagination. What else can you be, said Mr. Thomas Marvel, rubbing the back of his neck. Very well, said the voice in a tone of relief. Then I'm going to throw flints at you till you think differently. But where are you? The voice made no answer. Whiz came a flint, apparently out of the air, and missed Mr. Marvel's shoulder by a hair's breadth. Mr. Marvel, turning, saw flint jerk up into the air, trace a complicated path, hang for a moment, and then fling at his feet with almost invisible rapidity. He was too amazed to dodge. Whiz it came, and ricocheted from a bare toe into the ditch. Mr. Thomas Marvel jumped a foot and howled aloud. Then he started to run, tripped over an unseen obstacle, and came over and came head over heels into a sitting position. Now, said the voice, as a third stone curved upward and hung in the air above the trap, am I imagination? Mr. Marvel, by way of reply, struggled to his feet and was immediately rolled over again. He lay quiet for a moment. If you struggle any more, said the voice, I shall throw the flint at your head. It's a fair do, said Mr. Thomas Marvel, sitting up, taking his wounded toe in hand and fixing his eye on the third missile. I don't understand it. Stones flinging themselves, stones talking. Put yourself down. Rot away, I'm done. The third flint fell. It's very simple, said the voice. I'm an invisible man. Tell us something I don't know, said Mr. Marvel, gasping with pain. Where you've hid, how you do it. I don't know, I'm beat. That's all, said the voice. I'm invisible. That's what I want you to understand. Anyone could see that. There's no need for you to be so confounded and patient, mister. Now then, give us a notion. How are you hid? I'm invisible. That's the great point. And what I want you to understand is this. But whereabouts? Interrupted Mr. Marvel. Here, six yards in front of you. Oh, come, I ain't blind. You'll be telling me next you're just thin air. I'm not one of your ignorant tramps. Yes, I am thin air. You're looking through me. What? Ain't there any stuff to you? Vox say, what is it? Jabber is that? I am just a human being, solid, needing food and drink, needing covering too. But I'm invisible, you see. Invisible, simple idea, invisible. What? Real like? Yes, real. Let's have a hand of you, said, said Marvel. If you are real, it won't be so darn out of the way like. Then, Lord, he said, how you made me jump, gripping me like that. He felt the hand that had closed around his wrist with his disengaged fingers, and his fingers went timorously, <coughs> went timorously up the arm, patted a muscular chest, and explored a bearded face. Marvel's face was astonishment. I'm dashed, he said. If this don't beat cockfighting, most remarkable. And there I can see a rabbit clean through you, arf a mile away. Not a bit of you visible except... He scrutinized the apparent empty space cleanly. You haven't been eating bread and cheese, he asked, holding the invisible arm. You're quite right. And it's not quite assimilated into the system. Ah, said Mr. Marvel, sort of ghostly though. Of course, all this isn't half so wonderful as you think. Oh, it's quite wonderful enough for my modest wants, said Mr. Thomas Marvel. How would you manage it? How the deuce is it done? It's too long a story, and besides... I tell you, the whole business fairly beats me, said Mr. Marvel. 
What I want to say at present is this. I need help. I have come to that. I came upon you suddenly. I was wandering, mad with rage, naked, impotent. I could have murdered, and I saw you. Lord, said Mr. Marvel. I came up behind you, hesitated, went on. Mr. Marvel's expression was eloquent, then stopped. Here, I said, is an outcast like myself. This is the man for me. So I turned back and came to you. You and Lord, said Mr. Marvel, but I'm all in a tizzy. May I ask how is it and what you may be requiring in the way of help? Invisible. I want you to help get me clothes and shelter and then with other things. I've left them long enough. If you won't, well, but you will, must. Look here, said Mr. Marvel. I'm too flabbergasted. Don't knock me about any more and leave me go. I must get steady a bit and you've pretty near broke my toe. It's all so unreasonable. Empty downs, empty sky, nothing visible for miles except the bosom of nature. And then comes a voice, a voice out of heaven, and stones, and a fist. Lord, pull yourself together, said the voice, for you have to do the job I've chosen for you. Mr. Marvel blew out his cheeks, and his eyes were round. I've chosen you, said the voice. You are the only man except some of those fools down there who knows there is such a thing as an invisible man. You have to be my helper. Help me, and I will do great things for you. An invisible man is a man of power. He stopped for a moment to sneeze violently. At you! But if you betray me, he said, if you fail to do as I direct you, he paused and tapped Mr. Marvel's shoulder smartly. Mr. Marvel gave a yelp of terror at the touch. I don't want to betray you said Mr. Marvel, edging away from the, line, from the direction of the fingers. Don't you go a-thinking that, whatever you do, all I want to do is to help you, just tell me what I got to do. Lord, whatever you want done, that I'm most willing to do. Chapter 10 Mr. Marvel's Visit to Ipping After the first gusty panic had spent itself, Ipping became argumentative. Skepticism suddenly reared its head, rather nervous skepticism. Not at all assured of its back, but skepticism nevertheless. It is so much easier not to believe in an invisible man and those who had actually seen him dissolve into air or felt the strength of his arm could be counted on the fingers of two hands. And of these witnesses, Mr. Wages was presently missing, having retired impregnably behind the bolts and bars of his own house. And Jaffers was lying stunned in the parlour of the coach and horses. Great and strange ideas transcending experience often have less effect upon men and women than smaller, more tangible considerations. Ipping was gay with bunting and everybody was in gala dress. Whit Monday had been looked forward to for a month or more. By the afternoon, even those who believed in the unseen were beginning to resume their little amusements in a tentative fashion, on the supposition that he had quite gone away, and with the sceptics he was already a jest. But people Skeptics and believers alike were remarkably sociable all that day. Hayes Man's Meadow was gay with a tent, 
in which Mrs. Bunting and other ladies were preparing tea, while without, the Sunday school children ran races and played games under the noisy guidance of the curate and the Mrs. Cuss and Sackbutt. No doubt there was a slight uneasiness in the air, but people for the most part had the sense to conceal whatever imaginative qualms they experienced. On the village green an inclined strong, down which, clinging the while to a pulley swung handle, one could be hurled violently against a sack at the other end. Came in for considerable favour among the adolescent, as also did the swings in the coconut shies. There was also promenading in the steam organ attached to a small roundabout, filled the air with a pungent flavour of oil and with equally pungent music. Members of the club who had attended church in the morning were splendid in badges of pink and green and some of the gayer-minded had also adorned their bowler hats with brilliant coloured favours of ribbon. Old Fletcher, whose conceptions of holiday-making were severe, was visible through the jasmine about his window or through the open door, whichever way you chose to look, poised delicately on a plank supported on two chairs and white washing the ceiling of his front room. About four o'clock, a stranger entered the village from the direction of the Downs. He was a short, stout person in an extraordinarily shabby top hat, and he appeared to be very much out of breath. His cheeks were alternately, his cheeks were alternately limp and tightly puffed. His molted face was apprehensive, and he moved with a sort of reluctant, alas, alacrity. With a sort of reluctant alacrity. 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 Brisk and cheerful readiness. Eagerness. He, his molted face was apprehensive, and he moved with a sort of reluctant alacrity. He turned the corner of the church and directed his way to the coach and horses. Among others, old Fletcher remembers seeing him, and indeed the old gentleman was so struck by his peculiar agitation that he inadvertently, that he inadvertently allowed a quantity of whitewash to run down the brush into the sleeve of his coat while regarding him. This stranger to the perceptions of the proprietor of the coconut shy appeared to be talking to himself, and Mr. Huckster remarked the same thing. He stopped at the foot of the coach and houses, coach and horses. He stopped at the foot of the coach and horses steps and according to Mr. Huckster, appeared to undergo a severe internal struggle before he could induce himself to enter the house. Finally, he marched up the steps and was seen by Mr. Huckster to turn to the left and open the door of the parlour. Mr. Huckster heard voices from within the room and from the bar apprising the man of his error. That room's private, said Hall and the stranger shut the door clumsily and went into the bar. In the course of a few minutes he reappeared, wiping his lips with the back of his hand with an air of quiet satisfaction that somehow impressed Mr. Huckster as assumed. He stood looking about him for some moments, and then Mr. Huckster saw him walk in an orderly, furtive manner towards the gates of the yard upon which the parlour window opened. The stranger, after some hesitation, leant against one of the gateposts, produced a short clay pipe, and prepared to fill it. His fingers trembled while doing so. He lit it clumsily, and folding his arms, began to smoke in a languid attitude. 
an attitude which his occasional glances up the yard altogether bellied. All this Mr. Huxter saw over the canisters of the tobacco window, and the singularity of the man's behaviour prompted him to maintain his observations. Presently the stranger stood up abruptly and put his pipe in his pocket, then he vanished into the yard. Forthwith, Mr. Huxter, conceiving he was witness of some petty larceny, leapt round his counter and ran out into the road to intercept the thief. As he did so, Mr. Marvel reappeared, his hat askew, a big bundle in a blue tablecloth in one hand, and three books tied together, as it proved afterwards with the vicar's braces in the other. Directly he saw Huxter, he gave a sort of gasp, and turned sharply to the, to the left, began to run. Stop, thief! cried Huxter, and set off after him. Mr. Huxter's sensations were vivid but brief. He saw the man just before him, and spurting briskly for the church corner and the hill road, he saw the village flags and festivities beyond, and a face or so turned towards him. He bawled, Stop! again. He had hardly gone ten strides before his shin was caught in some mysterious fashion, and he was no longer running, but flying with, on, but flying with inconceivable rapidity through the air. He saw the ground suddenly close to his face. The world seemed to splash into a million whirling specks of light and subsequent proceedings interested him no more. Chapter 11 In the Coach and Horses Now, in order clearly to understand what had happened in the inn, it is necessary to go back to the moment when Mr. Marvel first came into view of Mr. Huxter's window. At the precise moment, Mr. Cuss and Mr. Bunting were in the parlour. They were seriously investigating the strange occurrences of the morning, and were, with Mr. Hall's permission, making a thorough examination of the invisible man's belongings. Jaffers had partially recovered from his fall, and had gone home in the charge of his sympathetic friends. The stranger's scattered garments had been removed by Mrs. Hall, and the room tidied up. And on the table under the window where the stranger had been wont to work, Cuss had hit almost at once on three big books in manuscript labelled Diary. Diary? said Cuss, putting the three books on the table. Now, at any rate, we shall learn something. The vicar stood with his hands on the table. Diary, repeated Cuss, sitting down, putting two volumes to support the third, and opening it. Hmm, no name on the flyleaf. Bother, cipher and figures. The vicar came round to look over his shoulder. Cuss, turning the pages over with a face suddenly disappointed, I'm... Dear me, it's all cipher bunting. There are no diagrams, asked Mr. Bunting. No illustrations throwing light. See for yourself, said Mr. Cuss. Some of it's mathematical and some of it's Russian or some such language to judge by the letters and some of it's Greek. Now the Greek, I thought you, of course, said Mr. Bunting, taking out and wiping his spectacles and feeling suddenly very uncomfortable, for he had no Greek left in his mind worth talking about. Yes, the Greek, of course, may furnish a clue. I'll find you a place. I'd rather glance through the volumes first said Mr. Bunting, still wiping. A general impression first, Cuss, and then, you know, we can go looking for clues. He coughed, <coughs> put on his glasses, 
rearranged them fastidiously, coughed again, <coughs> and wished something would happen to avert the seemingly inevitable exposure. Then he took the volume Cuss handed him in a leisurely manner, and then something did happen. The door opened suddenly. Both gentlemen started violently, looked round and were relieved to see a sporadically rosy face beneath a furry silk hat. Tap? asked the face and stood staring. No, said both gentlemen at once. Over the other side, my man, said Mr. Bunting. And please shut the door, said Mr. Cuss irritably. All right, said the intruder as it seemed in a low voice curiously different from the huskiness of his first inquiry. Right you are, said the intruder in, a, in the former voice. Stand clear, and he vanished and closed the door. A sailor, I judge, said Mr. Bunting. Amusing fellows they are. Stand clear indeed, a nautical term. Referring to his getting back out of the room, I suppose. I dare say so, said Cuss. My nerves are all loose today. It quite made me jump, the door opening like that. Mr. Bunting smiled as if he had not jumped. And now, he said with a sigh, ah, these books. Someone sniffed as he did so. One thing is indisputable, said Bunting, drawing up a chair next to that of Cuss. There certainly have been very strange things happen in Iping during the last few days. Very strange. I cannot, of course, believe in this absurd invisibility story. It's incredible, said Cuss. Incredible. But the fact remains that I saw, I certainly saw right down his sleeve. But did you? Are you sure? Suppose a mirror, for instance. Hallucinations are so easily produced. I don't know if you have ever seen a really good conjurer. I won't argue again, said Cuss. We've thrashed that out, Bunting. Just now there's these books. Ah, here's some of what I take to be Greek. Greek letters, certainly. He pointed to the middle of the page. Mr. Bunting flushed slightly and brought his face nearer, apparently finding some difficulty with his glasses. Suddenly, he became aware of a strange feeling at the nape of his neck. He tried to raise his head and encountered an immovable resistance. The feeling was a curious pressure, the grip of a heavy, firm hand, and it bore his chin irresistibly to the table. Don't move, little men, whispered a voice, or I'll brain you both. He looked into the face of Cuss, close to his own, and each saw a horrified reflection of his own sickly astonishment. I'm sorry to handle you so roughly, said the voice, but it's unavoidable. Since when did you learn to pry into an investigator's private memoranda, said the voice, and two chins struck the table simultaneously, and two sets of teeth rattled. Since when did you learn to invade the private rooms of a man in misfortune? And the concussion was repeated. Where have they put my clothes? Listen said the voice. The windows are fastened, and I've taken the key out of the door. I am a fairly strong man, and I have the poker handy. Besides being invisible, there's not the slightest doubt that I could kill you both and get away quite easily if I wanted to. Do you understand? Very well. If I let you go, Will you promise not to try any nonsense and do what I tell you? The vicar and the doctor looked at one another, and the doctor pulled a face. Yes, said Mr. Bunting, 
and the doctor repeated it. Then the pressure on the necks, on the necks relaxed, and the doctor and the vicar sat up, both very red in the face and wriggling their heads. Please keep sitting where you are, said the invisible man. Here's the poker, you see. When I came into this room, continued the invisible man, after presenting the poker to the tip of the nose of each of his visitors, I did not expect to find it occupied, and I expected to find, in addition to my books of memoranda, an outfit of clothing. Where is it? No, don't rise. I can see it's gone. Now, just at present, though the days are quite warm enough for an invisible man to run about stark, the evenings are quite chilly. I want clothing and other accommodation. And I must have, and I must also have those three books. Chapter 12. The Invisible Man Loses His Temper. It is unavoidable that at this point the narrative should break off again for a certain very painful reason that will presently be apparent. While these things were going on in the parlour and while Mr. Huxter was watching Mr. Marvel smoking his pipe against the gate, not a dozen yards away were Mr. Hall and Teddy Henfrey discussing in a state of cloudy puzzlement the one ipping topic. Suddenly, there came a violent thud against the door of the parlour, a sharp cry, and then silence. Hello, said Teddy Hentry. Hello, from the tap. Mr. Hall took things in slowly but surely. That ain't right, he said, and came round from behind the bar towards the parlour door. He and Teddy approached the door together with intent faces. Their eyes considered. Somewhat wrong, said Hal, said Hall and Hentry. Somewhat wrong? said Hall, and Henfrey nodded agreement. Whiffs of un unpleasant chemical odour met them, and there was a muffled sound of conversation, very rapid and subdued. You all right there? asked Hall, rapping. The muttered conversation ceased abruptly, for a moment's silence. Then the conversation was resumed in hissing whispers. Then a sharp cry of, No, no you don't. There came a sudden motion and the oversetting of a chair, a brief struggle, silence again. What the deuce? exclaimed Hentry, sotto voce. You all right there? asked Mr. Hall sharply again. The vicar's voice answered with a curious jerking intonation. Uh, quite right. Please, uh, don't interrupt. Odd, said Mr. Hentry. Odd, said Mr. Hall. Says don't interrupt, said Hentry. I heard him, said Hall. And a sniff, said Hentry. They remained listening. The conversation was rapid and subdued. I can't, said Mr. Bunting, his voice rising. I tell you, sir, I will not. What was that? asked Hentry. Says he we're not, said Hall. What was speaking to us, was he? Disgraceful, said Mr. Bunting within. Disgraceful, said Mr. Hentry. I heard it distinct. Who's that speaking now? asked Henry. Mr. Cuss, I suppose, said Hall. Can you hear anything? Silence. The sounds within indistinct and perplexing. Sounds like throwing the tablecloth about, said Hall. 
Mrs. Hall appeared behind the bar. Hall made gestures of silence and invitation. This aroused Mrs. Hall's wifely opposition. What you're listening there for, Hall? she asked. Ain't you nothing better to do, busy day like this? Hall tried to convey everything by grimaces and dumb show, but Mrs. Hall was obdurate. She raised her voice, so Hall and Henry, rather crestfallen, tiptoed back to the bar, gesticulating to explain to her. At first, she refused to see anything in what they had heard at all. Then she insisted on Hall keeping silence, while Henry told her his story. She was inclined to think the whole business nonsense. Perhaps they were just moving the furniture about. I heard and say disgraceful, that I did, said Hall. I heard that, Mrs. Hall, said Henry. Like as not, began Mrs. Hall. Hish, said Mr. Teddy Henry. Didn't I hear the window? What window? asked Mrs. Hall. Parlour window, said Henry. Everyone stood listening intently. Mrs. Hall's eyes, directed straight before her, saw without seeing the brilliant oblong of the inn door, the road white and vivid, and Huxter's shop front blistering in the June sun. Abruptly, Huxter's door opened and Huxter appeared, eyes staring with excitement, arms gesticulating. Yap! cried Huxter. Stop, thief! And he ran obliquely across the oblong towards the yard gates and vanished. Simultaneously came a tumult from the parlour and a sound of windows being closed. Hall, Henry and the human contents of the tap rushed out at once, pell-mell into the street. They saw someone whisk round the corner towards the road, and Mr. Huxter executing a complicated leap in the air that ended on his face and shoulder. Down the street people were standing astonished, running towards them. Mr. Huxter was stunned. Henry stopped to discover this, but Hall and the two labourers from the tap rushed at once to the corner, shouting incoherent things, and saw Mr. Marvel vanishing by the corner of the church hall, of the church wall. They appeared to have jumped to the impossible conclusion that this was the invisible man suddenly become visible, and set off at once along the lane in pursuit. But Hall had all... But Hall had hardly run a dozen yards before he gave a loud shout of astonishment and went flying headlong sideways, clutching one of the labourers and bringing him to the ground. He had been charged just as one charges a man at football. The second labourer came round in a circle, stared, and conceiving that Hall had tumbled over his own accord, turned to resume the pursuit, only to be tripped by the ankle just as Huxter had been. Then, as the first labourer struggled to his feet, he was kicked sideways by a blow that might have felled an ox. As he went down, the rush from the direction of the village green came round the corner. First to appear was the proprietor of the coconut shy, a burly man in a blue jersey. He was astonished to see the lane empty, save for three men sprawling absurdly on the ground. And then something happened to his rearmost foot, and he went headlong and rolled sideways just in time to graze the feet of his brother and partner, following headlong. The two were then kicked, knelt on, fallen over, and cursed by quite a number of over-hasty people. Now, when Hall and Henry and the labourers ran out of the house, Mrs. Hall, who had been disciplined by years of experience, remained in the bar next to the till, and suddenly the parlour door was opened, and Mr. Cuss appeared, and without glancing at her, rushed at once, down the steps towards the corner. Hold him, he cried. Don't let him drop that parcel. He knew nothing of the existence of Marvel, for the invisible man had handed over the books and bundled in the yard. The face of Mr. Cuss was angry and resolute. 
but his costume was defective. A short, a sort of limp, white kilt that could only have passed muster in Greece. Hold him, he bawled. He's got my trousers and every stitch of the vicar's clothes. Tend to him in a minute, he cried to Henry as he passed the prostrate huckster and coming round the corner to join the tumult was promptly knocked off his feet into an indecorous sprawl. Indecorous sprawl. Indecorous. Indecorous. Not in keeping with good taste and propriety. Improper. Indecorous was promptly knocked off his feet into an indecorous sprawl. Somebody in full flight trod heavily on his finger. He yelled, struggled to regain his feet, was knocked against and thrown on all fours again, and became aware that he was involved, not in a capture, but a rout. Everyone was running back to the village. He rose again and was hit severely behind the ear. He staggered and set off back to the coach and horses, forthwith leaping over the deserted huckster who was now sitting up on his way. Behind him, as he was halfway up the inn steps, he heard a sudden yell of rage, rising sharply out of the confusion of cries and a sounding smack in someone's face. He recognized the voice as that of the invisible man, and the note was that of a man suddenly infuriated by a painful blow. In another moment, Mr. Cuss was back in the parlour. He's coming back, Bunting, he said, rushing in. Save yourself! Mr. Bunting was standing in the window, engaged in an attempt to clothe himself in the hearth rug in the West Surrey Gazette. Who's coming? he said so startled that his costume narrowly escaped disintegration. Invisible man, said Cuss, and rushed to the window. We'd better clear out from here. He's fighting mad, mad. In another moment, he was out in the yard. Good heavens, said Mr. Bunting, haste hesitating between two horrible alternatives. He heard a frightful struggle in the passage of the inn, and his decision was made. He clambered out of the window, adjusted his costume hastily, and fled up the fla- and fled up the village as fast as his fat little legs would carry him. From the moment when the invisible man screamed with rage and Mr. Bunting made his memorable flight up the village, it became impossible to give a consecutive account of affairs in Ipping. Possibly, the invisible man's original intention was simply to cover Marvell's retreat with the clothes and books. But his temper, at no time very good, seems to have gone completely at some chance blow, and forthwith he set to smiting and overthrowing for the mere satisfaction of hurting. You must figure the street full of running figures, of doors slamming and fights of hiding places and fights for hiding places. You must figure the tumult suddenly striking on the unstable equilibrium of old Fletcher's planks in two chairs with cataclysmic results. You must figure an appalled couple caught dismally in a swing. And then the whole tumultuous rush has passed and the Ipping Street, with its gods and flags, is deserted, save for the still raging unseen and littered with coconuts, overthrown canvas screens, and the scattered stock in trade of a sweet stuff store. Everywhere there is a sound of closing shutters and shoving bolts, and the only visible humanity is an occasional flitting eye under a raised eyebrow in the corner of a window pane. The invisible man amused himself for a little while by breaking all the windows in the coach and horses, in the coach and horses, and then he thrust a street lamp through the parlour window of Mrs. Gribble. He, it must have been, who cut the telegraph wire to Adderdean just beyond Higgins's cottage on the Adderdean road. And after that, 
as his peculiar qualities allowed, he passed out of human perceptions altogether, and was neither heard, seen, nor felt in Iping any more. He vanished absolutely. But it was the best part of two hours before any human being ventured out again into the desolation of Iping Street.